let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm your host. I'm the organizer. I'm your guide to the next hour. I'm the cat herder for today. And I'm delighted to see so many of you here today to meet a terrific guest talking about a vital subject. We've been covering the subject of equity a great deal over the past year in the Future Trends Forum. We've had many guests who've been exploring it from a wide range of subjects, positions, and different institutions. We've had scholars, we've had activists, we've had researchers, we've had academic leaders. And one of the questions that keeps coming up is how we can lead an institution from the top to achieve greater equity in the academic experience. Now, Dr. Franklin Gilliam is the chancellor of the UN University of North Carolina, Greensboro, and he's been doing this in some really exciting, and interesting ways. So I'm actually, without any further ado, I'm actually delighted to welcome him to the stage and let's bring him up. Hello, Chancellor. Hi, how are you? Good. It's very good to see you. Good to see you. This is your campus office, I hope. Uh, well, I didn't think I'd steal into anyone else's. <laughs> well, you have some opportunities for that. Uh, how is everything there? Uh, warm, humid, and drippy. That sounds like North Carolina right about now. That sounds pretty classic. Uh, I hope you stay cool. Um, Chancellor, I have all kinds of questions to ask. And the first one uh, is to introduce you to folks. And the way I'd like to do that is to ask you, what will you be working on for the next year? What are the big projects? What are the big ideas that are uppermost in your mind? Well, uh, of course, the obvious issues that plague higher education, whether it's COVID, uh, uh, budgets, the existential threats to higher ed in general, um, we've been thinking about how we can use the pandemic to slingshot our way past our competitors. In other words, uh, I think the natural tendency has been to try to ride the pandemic out and you know, get back to what uh, people would call a state of normal or something like the new normal. Mm -hmm. But we're saying, how can we be different when we come out of this pandemic? How can we slingshot past folks? Uh, and so we're looking at three new initiatives uh, among among many others, but I'll talk about three real quickly. Uh, not surprisingly, we're very much interested in integrated student success. We've been, when I say integrated student success, and that means integrating the academic side of being a student with the business side of being a student with student well-being as sort of a three-legged stool integrated. Now, this is presents a challenge for those in, in higher ed may recognize um, getting cross-functional collaboration is not the easiest thing in the world to do in a university. Yes. And so actually is one of the things we learned from COVID that where we had to have cross-functional unit, um, uh, cross-functional committees and task force working on COVID, people discovered, gee whiz, maybe it's not such a bad thing working with folks outside of my unit. Uh, and so we've been trying to imbue this into the culture of the university. And one of the areas we've tried to do it is an integrated student success, which typically focuses on the academic part of being a student, the counseling, course selection and credits and all that. But we found that that is related to the business of being a student. Turns out students don't know when their bills are due and don't know what kind of financial aid is available to them and so on. All the things that are tied up in the business of being a student. And the third thing is, is their well-being. As we know, probably, and I'm sure you've covered on previous shows, uh, mental health and the stresses and strains on students, staff and faculty. But here talking about students really can have a corrosive impact on their uh, academic performance. So the idea is this interrelated model of student success. So that's one thing we'll be focusing on. Just one. Just one. After that, we're going to cure cancer. But the second thing that we're focusing on uh, is opening a new uh, facility we call Tate and Gate, which is marrying art and technology in the interstitial space between uh, campus activity and community activity. 
the idea here is to um, create a third space, a space where uh, creative activities can lead to a new way of thinking, acting, uh, engaging with our community and with our campus, providing opportunity for our students who are building this facility, 20,000 square foot facility. Wow. That, my admonition is I didn't want it to look like a university building. Whatever you do, yeah. don't make a, I, I'm sort of a child of the 1970s university architecture, which mm -hmm. most of us despise uh, <laughs> appropriately. Uh, and so uh, I said, don't make it look like that. Don't make it look like a university building. And so we're rethinking both uh, space in terms of design but also the kinds of things that go on in this space. We have a, uh, we are a campus that does well in the arts, particularly the performing arts, but the creative arts more generally. And so we're using this um, sort of object-based inquiry improve, to improve learning outcomes across a number of things. So we're using the museum actually, and now this adjacent uh, Tate and Gate facility, as we call it, uh, to really engage our students to improve learning outcomes and to provide opportunities for the campus and the community to engage in new artistic endeavors. And then the third thing we're doing, uh, again, among many others, but uh, one that's been interesting, we are developing an esports program. And we uh, now, I say this uh, with some uh, deserved degree of humility because the last video game I played was Pong. Oh. And that might have been in whenever Pong was invented. Point being, I know very little about video games. But I do know it is a thing. And we are building, uh, uh, some people call it arena. I say that's a little bit overstated. But we're building a, a significant space on the campus. Uh, actually, it'll open this fall. We are uh, developing and we'll be able to offer uh, badges and certificates in esports and the related uh, activities around it. And more importantly, perhaps, we now are looking very seriously at how we deal with it in our curriculum and how we deal with it in our research. If I actually have one research grant by our human performance folks, uh, looks like they're getting, but uh, everything from communication arts to computer science to yeah. uh, music turns out scoring for these video games is a thing. Yes. Uh, a very strong music program. Uh, so these are three of the things that um, we think plays, uh, that play both to our strengths on the campus, uh, play to student interest, and also are going to have a, an impact on our broader community. Well, fantastic. I mean, those are three they're very different, but they sound in some ways interestingly connected in that they're interdisciplinary and they have to do with space uh, as well as on all three of them, student success. Yeah. Uh, uh, friends, if you're if you're just joining us right now, we are hosting uh, Chancellor Frank Gilliam. I'm sorry, it's Gilliam, right? The hard Gilliam, Gilliam. yes. Gilliam. Yes, thank you. Uh, who's the uh, chancellor at uh, uh, UNC Greensboro. He is a uh, just telling us what he's going to be working on for the next year. And the theme for the, today is to discuss equity in higher education and how to bring this about uh, through leadership. Uh, the Future Trends Forum stands ready for all of you. I have a raft of questions, but the more important questions are the ones that you would like to raise. So again, remember, just on the bottom strip of the screen, there's uh, the raised hand button if you want to join us up here. Uh, and I, I promise you can join us even if you don't have a mustache and beard. Uh, although that does seem to be the dress code for today. Uh, and click the Q&A box if you've got any questions. And uh, as I say that, we've got our first question. And we just flash this on the screen so everyone can see it. This is from David Hool at National University. And David asks, could you speak more about how your campus intends to measure success within an degree of student success? And what could other universities and colleges do to mirror your success? Well, that's a, a good question, David. Uh, let me let me speak to it in, in a couple of ways. And if you could leave the question, can you leave the question up for me, Brian? Absolutely. Hang on, I'll put it right back up. Uh, um, so the, the typical typical things 
whether it's time to degree, we're really trying to encourage uh, uh, full uh, credit hour, um, taking full number of credit hours. Uh, it turns out at our university, the things that typically predict student success don't at most universities don't predict them at ours, income, family background, and so on. But don't seem to predict them as how much uh, support we can give the students. Mm -hmm. yeah, number of first generation students, we have 40 or 50% eligible population. I think the, we've, we've eliminated the black white achievement gap. We, our first year retention rate is around 80%. So, wow. so for the population we're dealing with, and some of this has been uh, reported out in, in, uh, in, in the Chronicle, as well as other uh, other reports, Ed Trust, Gates Foundation. Um, we can continue to think the secret sauce, if you will, is in, is integrating and having integrated oversight over these three elements we think comprise student success. In other words, it's easy to focus on. Oh, we need more counselors. Or we need more guide. We need more uh, curricular uh, counselors. Yeah. So, part of the story, but that doesn't solve the problem if your student hasn't sort of figured out how to pay their bills, where resources wow. are, where wow. to get emergency funds from, or yeah. if they're having mental health struggles, who they can go talk to. It may have nothing to do with their ability to complete courses. Um, but it does, in many cases, matter that our students have the kinds of uh, educational and counseling supports. It's unfortunate because state at state universities, state appropriations don't cover the very thing we yeah. think really matters. Yeah. Uh, you know, God forbid you would, you would actually give money to, to the thing that matters and outcomes. So time to degree, degree efficiency, retention, particularly first year, second year, we're working hard on, um, we find that a lot of the students uh, stop out with uh, having difficulties with math, mm. we're working a lot around that. Mm. Um, and we have a very diverse student body, probably approaching again 50% non-white. Um, and so we're finding that even within the broader model, we're having to have some sort of micro, micro uh, modules, if you will, for different groups mm. of students. For example, Latinx students present a different set of issues than the African-American students do than the rural white students do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But all require the things that many, that, that a Duke student probably comes built in with when they show up on campus. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a, thank you. That's a, that's a detailed, indeed meticulous answer to uh, a really, really good question. Uh, so thank you again, uh, uh, Chancellor, and also thank you for our question. Uh, if you're again, if you're new to the forum, uh, David's question is a classic example of the Q&A box. So if you have any thoughts, any questions you'd like to put to our guest, just hit that box, type in it, and we'll proceed accordingly. And if you'd like to join us on stage, again, just hit the raise hand button. Uh, we have um, one recommendation came from the chat box from uh, Keenan Solonero, who recommended a, uh, a nonprofit in Oakland, California called Game Heads. Um, and uh, I just Ken and I just uh, tweeted that out so people could see it, um, and uh, so that might be one uh, one good source. If anyone in the audience is interested in gaming and education, we've had a, a series of sessions with different people over time, uh, including with the uh, uh, a brand new esports unit at a Texas College at uh, Austin College. Um, so while people are coming up with questions, uh, uh, Chancellor Gilliam, I, I, I'd like to ask one of my own really quickly. You mentioned in passing that you had eliminated the black-white achievement gap, and I had a brief coronary moment because that happened so quickly. I wanted to come back to that. Can you tell us, how did you do that? So, <laughs> so many schools are, are striving on that front, but how did you manage to put that in the rearview mirror so fast? I think there's a few things. One, I think it's recognizing that our African-American students, our black students, require a different set of supports than some of the other students. I mean, it should make sense, right? That if, if, if folks are coming from a different cultural experience, that they probably are going to require a different approach to how they uh, proceed through their educational uh, experience. So that's one of it. Uh, um, secondly, 
And I don't, I would, I don't, um, I, I don't attest uh, to any great scientific support for this, but I do believe the psychic benefit of having a threshold of black students on campus makes a difference. So even if you aren't, even if you are one of the only black students in a particular class, when the class is changed, you walk out the door and you see other people who look like you and you probably know somebody. And as, as a person who went through the opposite experience, mm. the only person in the classroom and the only person when you walk out the class, walk out of the classroom, it can be terribly isolating. Mm. And, and that sort of has a compounding effect. Third, I think that our, um, because of this threshold, students get involved and feel like they can make a difference. Their sense of belonging is high. So uh, it's, it, it is what we're doing in terms of student support, but I think it's also due to the, to, it also there is a psychological variable uh, mm. that, I, that I think plays a role. But what is that psychological variable? I think it's just, I think it's just threshold. I think it's a threshold. When you look around, there's enough people who look like me that I feel like I belong. Right? And in other words, if you walk out the, out of your classroom where you're the only person of color in the classroom, and then you walk out in your, your building that you're in, and everybody's moving about to go to class and nobody looks like you, you go, gee, do I belong here? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, you know, some of these things are simple. And, Absolutely. you know, the academy, as is our want, wants to start with everything with, well, it's really complicated. Uh -huh. Well, no, you've made it complicated. <laughs> Let's boil it down to some first principles. So, mm. well, thank you, thank you. That's a that's a for everybody else. That's a solid takeaway that everyone can uh, can learn from right away and apply. Uh, thank you, thank you for that. Um, we have more questions coming in, uh, okay. and we have one from a, a good friend and a, a author, Stephen Ehrman. Let me put this up on the screen for everybody. Equity and quality are often mentioned together. What does educational quality mean to you regarding UNCG? And how is UNCG working to improve it? And how does that relate to UNGC efforts to improve equity? So I assume, um, well, I assume he means the quality of instruction and pedagogy yes. on one hand and, yes. and equitable outcomes for students on the other. Okay. Um, so we have introduced a model we call embedded inclusive excellence. It's a mouthful, and we probably should come up with a more elegant uh, name for it. But we we borrowed a few things. We borrowed the concept of embeddedness from economic theory. Uh -huh. We can talk about that. Um, we all sort of have our versions of what inclusiveness or inclusive means. Uh, and the last part of it is the part that speaks to, well, the last part of it, excellence, speaks to his quality question. It's a pursuit of excellence. And whether it's in those instructing the students or in the students themselves pursuing excellence in the classroom, this is about quality education, high quality education. Uh, this is not teaching to the lowest common denominator, and it's not expecting that. So, so we start from a place where an expectation around excellence, both in instruction and in student performance. But embeddedness is uh, a different kind of, is a different take on this. So what happens at universities? They, and believe me, I've been doing this since 19, I was, I think my first professorship was uh, 1983. So I've been doing this a while. Hmm. Um, that the, the, was at University of Wisconsin. Mm. What universities have done over these however many years I've been in this business is that we get this call every 10, 15 years, or oh, you got to do something about diversity, equity, and so on. And so the university goes, okay, we're going to hire a chief diversity officer. We're going to give them mm -hmm. an administrative assistant. Mm -hmm. We're give them some money, and we're going to tell them, go over there and solve our diversity problem. Now, Believe me, this is nothing against chief diversity officers per se. They can play a, a pivotal role if done right. But I think it's easily easier 
and the evidence is it's much easier to marginalize those activities at a university. Hmm. The equity piece is around embeddedness. You have to embed equity in the DNA of the institution. And you have to embed expectations into the university that there will be inclusiveness. And so you therefore get at the professorial level, the assistant, associate, school, at the decanal level for leadership, vice chancellors, vice presidents, senior officials, you get people who are become embedded in the university who adhere to this value of inclusiveness. They understand the benefit of the inst to the institution of having a more inclusive search, if you will, for, uh, particularly in this case, I'll speak about faculty, for example, for faculty positions. You know, you can't pursue excellence if you, by definition, limit the scope of your search to just people you know if you are yeah. white, maybe, right? And it's not enough to go and ask your, your, your colleague of color down the hall, hey, do you know anybody? So it's, it doesn't serve the institution well. Let's no. formally expand our aperture, open it up, and say, where are the best people? Now, go back to excellence. Diversity for diversity's sake is, is actually harmful. I mean, you just don't hire somebody because they're a person of color or they're a woman or LGBTQ. And by the way, we're talking about black white here, but for me, diversity and inclusion is across a number of dimensions uh -huh. right here at this university. So this embeddedness, what is it? What do we do? We have, there's three elements to embeddedness, cultural embeddedness. This can come from the top because rhetoric is an agenda setting tool, right? If, if the chancellor or president says, you know what? I want these searches to be inclusive and don't bring me slates of just the same old folks from the same old places all the time. I'm not gonna stand for it. So what I tried to do when I first came here from the first day I got here was to change the culture and to say, we're going to be inclusive and we're going to pursue excellence. So we build the culture uh, around inclusiveness and we do it from a leadership point of view with rhetoric. Secondly, social embeddedness. So hmm. how social networks can turn to collective action and they have to build them and it has to happen at the local level. So this is a treetops, grassroots model, if you will. And we embedded them in research groups, with faculty, uh, learning circles. We developed. My pet project is leadership development. So I think we need to develop the leadership. That's the other thing, by the way, universities do when they want to diversify. They go, uh, the faculty, they go and hire a bunch, a bunch of assistant professors. I think that are at a disadvantage when they come and they can fire them if they don't want them. Mm -hmm. So I really press on full professors, tenure professors, deans, associate deans, vice presidents. The third piece of embeddedness is structural embeddedness. You have to change the policies, practices, and systems. You have to have goals and metrics. You have to hold leadership accountable. You have to train them how to search. You have to think of a new curriculum. You have to train your trustees. So the idea is this, again, this three-legged stool of cultural embeddedness, social embeddedness, structural embeddedness as a way to pursue both uh, quality and equity. Splendid. Um, and we have a paper on this coming out in Metropolitan University's journal. I don't know. So, no, I'd love to be able to share that um, when it comes out. Yeah. Uh, Metropolitan University's Journal? Yeah. Metropolitan University's Journal, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Steve, uh, thank you for the excellent, excellent question. Um, 
as always, again, if you're new to the forum, this is the kind of quality of questions that we get, as well as the wonderful quality of answers. So please feel free to uh, throw questions in the Q&A box or to uh, join us on stage. Uh, we have another question that's come in from uh, Kenan uh, Solanero at Reimagined Science, and Kenan asks, I'm interested in your third space. We have a third space event we've used to create co-creative space and prompt action. I'm interested in learning more about your design. Uh, that, that's a good question, Ken. And, um, we are just beginning the design of the design, mainly because we just got the money for the building. Um, and I would encourage you, uh, the new uh, director of the Weatherspoon Art Museum here on campus is, is leading this project, a woman named Juliette Bianco. You got her from the Hood Museum at Dartmouth. And she is really um, spearheading this project about these co-creation spaces. One of the things that we're now looking at is developing low latency networks. Hmm. We can have uh, simultaneous performances. Hmm. Somebody who takes uh, guitar lessons on Zoom, I know that um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the lag makes these perform, co you know, simultaneous performances impossible. So that's one of the other things we're doing. And the idea is also to put these low latency networks throughout the community. Uh, but I would encourage people to get in touch with Juliet, who can give you uh, uh, much more specific information. The thing about being chancellor is you know a, a whole lot, you know a very little about a whole lot of things. So I'm expiring my knowledge uh, quickly on some of these things. Uh, well, I, I appreciate that. Uh, are, are you an Internet 2 campus by any chance? Uh, I think we are. Well, that, would, that would help. But um, I'm not 100% sure about that. Uh, that would be uh, uh, that would be great if uh, for in terms of uh, low latency, that's that's pretty solid. Um, we have questions that are just coming in now, and uh, we have uh, video questions, um, including one from a long-term friend of the program, George Station at Cal State Monterey Bay. Mm -hmm. Let me bring him up here. Hello, George. Okay. Uh, hi, Brian uh, and Chancellor. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi, hey, George. How are you? Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Okay. Um, so um, you said something when you were talking about that uh, structural leg of embeddedness mm -hmm. that caught my ear. And I was trying to get a question together anyway about um, how you and your colleagues are doing after last summer's unrest, um, the uh, killing of George Floyd, um, every president and chancellor I know of put up a statement. They were, some of them were pretty flat, some of them were very good, um, but everybody said they were being anti-racist, that's great. Um, this year, almost everybody said something when Derek Chauvin got convicted, and all that's great too. Um, so, and, but when you said uh, metrics, accountability, and training of trustees, the training of trustees is what got me there because it's like, okay, that's pushing uphill a little bit, I'm sure, in some cases. In North Carolina is yeah. pushing up <laughs> and, Kilimanjaro. And I'm, uh, I'm in uh, the Cal State system, uh, yep. and so well. I'm uh, California, North Carolina, whatever. <laughs> you know, uh, it's, there are some similarities. So my uh, question is, how are you think you and your colleagues are doing with all those great statements about anti-racism. Any progress since last year? I appreciate some of the things you've said, but um, maybe if you'd also add in, how do you think some of your colleagues are doing and where do does more work need to be done? So a few things, and thank you for the question, George, and I have many colleagues in the Cal State system after spending 29 years in the UC system, so mm -hmm. you know it well. Um, first of all, let me just speak to goals and metrics, just just for because then I see a couple other people have have uh, have asked about that. We're holding the for at least in terms of faculty, we're holding the deans accountable, and their reviews depend on how they're doing. And the provost is all over them, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one of the ways they understand this is important, and that's why the cultural embeddedness part, mm -hmm. the rhetoric from the top, matters. 
Uh, as a in terms of structure, the trustees just had a retreat uh, a week or two ago, and they had got a EDI training and got it from a really good good group who I think, and we have, a, they are, I see some of the people talking about their political appointees yeah. uh, and their appointees here by a board of governors who are really uh, driven by the, by the legislature. And, um, but it turned out to be pretty well received. Uh, now we'll see. There's still, you know, one training is not going to, I'm not naive, I'm not going to change everything. But it's the first time there's ever been a training. <laughs> and and I, what did George Gerber say about me? It has to be the drip, drip, drip. You know, mm -hmm. you just have to keep after it. And what typically happens is universities do it or some administration at the university does it and the administration changes and they don't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so while it, the conversations were uncomfortable to some degree, you know, we have a student body that's approaching 50% non-white, you better have the conversation. And um, so, we're, you know, look, uh, this is, this is a, uh, an empirical question of how much, and we can make it, we've taken down names from buildings, we've, mm -hmm. we've, you know, and we've used them as teachable moments. And uh, we've done it with a conservative board. So it, it can be done, um, but I think it requires, I think it requires a leavening of our rhetoric from those who fashion themselves to be on the left and this is a public forum we're in, so I don't want to out myself a whole lot, but um, political rhetoric in these discussions, and I'm talking about the kind of cultural rhetoric I was talking about from an institutional point of view, uh, exacerbates the problem. So we said, look, folks, this is an issue. This is an issue we probably need to address and solve. It's not going anywhere. Here are some ways to think about it. And I think, I think it was well received. Um, the search training, by the way, for uh, search chairs in, in the university has gone pretty well. People, a lot of people, well, they have said they just didn't know. You can take that for what you will, George. Yeah, I wish I had my glasses on so I could look out over those glasses. Yeah, well, <laughs> George, don't get me in trouble here. Yeah, because, um, yeah, my, I've been in uh, the Cal State system for 20 years, and I was in the uh, Navy before that. So I've been on a couple of committees, and yeah, <laughs> um, I, I appreciate maybe not knowing how to do things well. So those search faculty search trainings and dean search trainings, because for those committees, can really help if they take the training to heart. Obviously, yeah, if they uh, so, resent the training, it's a problem. Yeah, you know, but uh, you know, it's uh, one thing about having people in leadership positions which is I can tell them that we're not going to smile favorably upon you if you resent the training. Mm -hmm. this, look, we've, in, we've increased minority faculty by, I don't know, 30% over the last four or five years. And we've hired over 400 new faculty, 100 of them new, net new, meaning not mm -hmm. replacements. Mm -hmm. And our research productivity has gone up by 43%. So clearly, they're not having yeah. a tag on our productivity. Yeah. Uh, love to use that as an example. In fact, I will be taking that back as an example. Thank you. Uh, so uh, just one quick follow up on uh, the training for uh, trustees, just to dig in just a little bit on, on that. Um, uh, I, given that it's the first training and, I, and first in whatever that becomes, um, I'm wondering, because of all the rhetoric, again, that emerged over the last year during the pandemic on equity issues, but also on just the summer of unrest and everything that led, went from that, um, did the training actually go there with what we now call anti-racism, or did it, was it more like a 101, 
just to get the trustees' feet wet to get started um, because I, they just, you know, I, I they're think, beginners. I think neither. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to say something that is probably going to be unpopular. But um, uh, you're just trying to get in trouble. Yeah. You're just well, in trouble. I, I'm already in trouble, so please join me. <laughs> well, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Well, you, I don't know if I can afford to be in trouble. Let, let's just say um, I uh, I don't know I don't know about the efficacy or the um, and uh, I don't know about anti-racist sure. anything. Hmm. Yeah, I, I'm I and actually I hear you on that, which is the part that gets me in trouble. So um, I, I so I'm wondering what is going beyond the traditional EDI, DEI, however, you know, well, you order it. Is, what what went beyond it, I guess, I is what I'm really asking. The history of some things. People yeah. just didn't know. Yeah, adults, 60, yeah. 70, 80 years old, just didn't know because part of the problem is we don't teach it in the schools. Mm -hmm. They didn't even know things that had happened in North Carolina. So you think of the Tulsa. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. yeah. People in Tulsa didn't know. So we had it, as you know here, probably, in uh, Wilmington in the early parts of the 20th mm -hmm. century. They learned mm -hmm. folk out in Wilmington. Mm -hmm. What is not taught in the North Carolina school system. Mm -hmm. So you would think, mm -hmm. but so there's, and, and, there are empirical patterns that you cannot deny. There's data that you cannot deny. Mm -hmm. And so part of it is showing the data. Yeah. Not, not, and, but not starting the conversation with, you are to blame. I want you to renounce your privilege. I, I, that's a not conversation non-starter. It just is. Whether you think it's a good thing to do or not, I don't know. But it's a... In a group of well-heeled white folks to tell them to start any conversation by renouncing their privilege and, and and admitting their complicity is just not a good conversation starter. I'm interested in the outcomes. Yeah. Personally. I'm interested in students I care about doing better, faculty I care about doing better, communities I care about doing better. That's what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in you know having a big kumbaya moment yeah i yeah i i uh am i'll concur with you and not looking for that moment uh i think we've had moments like that where nothing else changed but everybody did say the proper kumbaya so i'm not really looking for those um i'm hoping that there is some pathway in there where uh essentially the folks you just described could actually um, as whether we go all the way and say we need a truth and reconciliation process or something else, <laughs> it's like at some point somebody's got to admit they did something wrong because well, otherwise they will. It's thing. like yeah, I, 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 okay. So well, I'll, you, and I'll, I, you and I may have disagreed with there. I, yeah, yeah, we might, we might. Because I'm more instrumental than that. Okay, I'm instrumental. <laughs> I want stuff yeah. done for people I care about. So okay. I, I start. We want to be. How do we get to prosperity for everybody? How do we get, do you, do you not want prosperity for everybody? You only want it for some I people? Do. That's hard to say. I, yes, I only want it for some people. Yeah. But what yeah. I engage you in a conversation about, okay, what's the future prosperity of North Carolina look like? Hmm. In North, can, this, can this structure survive with large swaths of the population being unhealthy and uneducated? What's that? Imagine what that future looks like and what does it cost you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to um, actually uh, get off stage and let other people come up, but I want to um, leave you with an example of a university that actually admitted they did something wrong, and that's Georgetown, which is where Brian yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so basically, I know it can be done in conversation with white folks. And so I'm going to get off stage and let other people continue, but I'm thinking the Georgetown example might be something to look if, into if, it, look if, into. But you're after, yeah. Thank you okay. for the uh, thank you for the question and thank you for, and for that last thought and all the questions, George. Thank Great. you. Great and thanks, Brian, for bringing me up on stage and, and Chancellor. Good to meet you. Nice meeting you. Yeah, always a pleasure. Always a pleasure.
Uh, we have we have more questions coming in. And again, if you're new to the forum, you can see that we have deep questions and conversation goes in all directions, uh, including back and forth and opposition and in a very ultimately positive way. Uh, we have another um, uh, questioner who wants to join us on stage, and this is Professor Jennifer Lee Gagne. Uh, she's going to correct me if I've massacred her name completely. And she's coming to us from Mount St. Mary College in uh, upstate New York. Hello, Professor Lee Gagne. How close did I come? Actually, you did really, really well. Oh, thank you. I am, I'm impressed. Well, um, it's good of you to join us. Welcome aboard. Um, what would you uh, what would you like to ask uh, Chancellor Gilliam? Um, I was really interested in the um, let's see if I can get this in the comment that you made about accountability for the people in leadership positions, and that to me resonated because it's something that we're struggling with at my small private liberal arts institution that is just getting on the DEI um, the DEI train, mm -hmm. and so. One thing that I've been hearing a lot from students, um, other faculty, staff, is how and who can hold the people above us accountable when they don't step up, they fall short. Um, and so that was really exciting for me to actually hear someone in your position say, oh no, accountability is something for, for all of us. And so I'm interested in the real kind of tangible ways for which accountability can be um, experienced for those people. And also just as a side note, I'm team truth and reconciliation commissions. So I just want to put that out there. So as someone who does restorative justice work, no, I'm, I'm all not, about no, <laughs> truth no, and reconciliation commission. I'm not mad at you. And I think people need to do I do. And I think it's important that people do that work. I'm not going to do that work. That's a fair point. You know what? Because I feel like there's other stuff like within my field, like I'm going to leave that to people and I'm just going to go ahead and handle this stuff over here. So yeah. I, I totally yeah. get on that. But if you can tell me or give me some examples about ways that we can actually hold a president of a university or college accountable, like that to me would be revolutionary. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, that's a hard one. That's a hard one for me, Professor, because I'm that guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I don't know how to tell some other president they need to be held accountable. Look, they report to their boards, right? And I don't know who sits on the board of Mount St. Mary's and yeah. to what extent they're even interested in these topics, but it is a question it would seem to me to be fair to ask of the board of trustees and say, how are you holding... First of all, are you holding the yeah. president of the university accountable for tangible outcomes, not rhetoric, not doing something on Martin Luther King Day, mm -hmm. anything, something? I mean, look, I'm being a bit facetious here. Don't, don't get me wrong. These things are important. But tangible outcomes. Are your faculty, do you have uh, people of color, do you have faculty of color? Are they progressing at the same rates? Are there is there is there are there pay equity issues? Do you have any folks in leadership? Do you have a pipeline to get deans, department chairs? Do you have a way to compensate people who are chairing the DEI committee? Okay, you speaking right now to me because that's what I'm doing right now and having those same know. conversations. Like, well, what is that's what I'm saying? It because yeah. I've been there. Look, I did it at a time when we had nobody. And they, we, they, you had to do it, you know, they came to you, do fix it, do it, and we did it all. At least I think there are, there is a network, a national network of folks, at least where you can get some support. Um, but, but it, so for example, you're doing all the DEI work. Are you getting an ad, are you getting ad pay for it? Are you getting course release for it? I had to fight for the course release, but I got it. I know you did. But that's that's where we're at, right? The chair of your department has to support you. I mean, it's tough. I look, you're a small liberal arts school. I, I mean, I get it. And you're you're fighting against a pretty strong headwind out there, and you're trying to you're trying to you know take care of your own career. Yeah. Right. I get yeah. that too. Believe me, I've uh, been there, been there. Um, but at least you can raise the questions. 
I think, okay. you know, I think you've got to, as, as a group, as and, and if you have allies, great. I'm not against allies. I think that what's interesting is the the board of training, the board of trustees training that you talked about. And I think that's kind of the level that we're starting at, where I think that we need to have that level of training, not just for our incoming faculty or our established faculty, but also for all the levels up to and including the board of trustees. Yeah. Because I think that you're right that our level of accountability for the president is that board. So that board has to know what they need to do and expect from him in terms of these issues. And he needs to know what he needs to do and what's expected of him. So I think that that might be a place for us to start having a conversation is what are we doing for the board of trustees and then kind of working it that way while simultaneously try to do all of these other kind of training. So I appreciate that. I really do. And I think it's interesting. Um, and I know that we're apples and oranges in terms of all aspects of institutions from size and location and history and background. But I do think that's a common thread um, for those institutions that are still struggling with trying to figure out how to do this and how to have equity. But I do think the leadership is what's going to be important and thinking about how we get the board of trustees on board as well. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Professor Lee Gagne. And um, please say hi to Mount St. Mary's for me. I will. Thank you. Welcome to, welcome to the forum. Uh, friends, we're we're at the very, very last five minutes of the session, and, and this gives you all uh, your last shot to put in a question or comment. And as the moderator and host, I'm going to fully take advantage of that opportunity to ask a question of my own. But first, I do want to share a uh, comment that's come in from the chat back and forth um, about trustees. Um, it seems like the importance of training trustees is there. Uh, Phil Katz uh, mentions that it's tough to train them when they're political appointees, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to donors or, or alumni supporters, which is a, which is a good problem. Um, I guess a question I have for you, Chancellor Gilliam, is uh, trying to imagine this work in the future. I mean, you've described closing the Blackwood achievement gap. You've described hiring minority faculty by increasing the numbers by 30 percent, which is tremendous. Uh, and it, what happens if, if this work goes on for, say, 10 years? What does what does a university like Greensboro look like after all this has been done? That's a good question. I mean, uh, you know, I think what we hope for, quite frankly, is that we become a modern university. Mm. Mm. Right, not an anachronistic university. Hmm. And higher hmm. education impulses are anachronistic. Mm -hmm. They all want to look like Princeton in 1950. Mm -hmm. And we have to change the model of what a modern university in a multicultural democratic society looks like. And we cannot cling to a 19th century version of a 17th century European model <laughs> of what universities are. And um, it means we're probably going to be organized a little differently. Uh, I try to make, I'm trying to make our organization flatter, therefore a bit more, uh, a bit more democratic. Uh -huh. uh, we need to distribute decision making. Uh, That's hard. We need to have people. Somebody wrote in the chat, well, what did they say? I thought it was an interesting comment that, well, people, you can get two different people who, what is this? It's about diversity. Let's see. How can you claim diversity with two people who look different and come from different countries, yet they're born into the same, same milieu? Well, the idea is that you try to get a diversity of lived experience. Now, grant that it's all in a Western democratic capitalism milieu. I mean, I get all that. But there's some really quite different lived experiences within that milieu. And that gives you different leverage, different leverage on what we can be. Hmm. And so for me, uh, we look like a modern university, not a not an anachronistic one. So when you think about the US census report that just came out. And, and we think about uh, how the changing demographic makeup of the United States, how that's what UNGC, UNCG should look like instead of like a, 
Well, and it's not just the demographics. It's just how we approach higher education, right? It's, it's, just, it's in everybody's interest. You know, this is how we're going to move together forward or this thing is going to unravel. And it's a bit tattered right now, if you ask me. Well, I agree. That seems to be our conclusion after years of doing this. Um, on Twitter, you have a shout out from one uh, Jack Shaw, who is uh, the AVP for Campus Services at Shepherd University, who says quite clearly and simply, glad to see the G in the lead on this. <laughs> so good to see that. Um, we are uh, also in the lead of being at the top of the hour once more. Uh, we have run right through 60 minutes and incredible speed. Um, Chancellor Gilliam, uh, talking to you, I feel like I'm, I'm not just talking to a chancellor from a modern university, but a chancellor from a future university uh, and the kind that we should aspire to be. Uh, what's the best way for people to keep up with you and your work and to find out about how your center and all these projects come along? Well, I, I saw my, all my, my media folks from my university on the, on the, uh, in the audience. So Eden or Y.E. or one of you, if you want to put something in the chat that, uh, they don't trust me to do any of this, Brian. I screw it up. <laughs> you know, you don't, it's a bad question to ask me. But I have some folks who are much more adept at this than I, but I think are still in your audience and they can up uh, there you put our twitter handle yes. yeah, you can tell if it looks like dad twitter like that's actually me responding that's you. okay but if it looks like real twitter it's my twitterers responding well see that's a that's a great answer that's a that's a chancellor's answer you you point to the people who are doing the work which yeah I, I mean i do tweet but i usually screw that up too so yeah don't trust the leader yes <laughs> Dr. that is correct uh, you know, never trust the man. That's what I say. Even um, I am the man. Well, uh, well, you're doing a great job as the man. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing an hour, your experience, your thoughts, and for taking all of our questions so deeply and so seriously. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Uh, and and we look forward to seeing where uh, where you take the G over the next year. And we will okay. hopefully, hopefully bring you back. Thank you. All right. Thank you. But don't go away, friends. Um, I need to point out where um, where the forum is going uh, over the next bit. Uh, make sure you can see that. And I do want to repeat my thanks to all of you for the fantastic question so far. And in the chat, by the way, uh, we've got uh, Eden Bloss and uh, uh, who is sharing uh, some links as well. Uh, so just looking ahead, we have uh, sessions coming up on education and a post-truth world. We have sessions on active learning, STEM and equity, open access scholarship, rethinking learning, rethinking the whole university. If you'd like to keep talking about these questions, about how to train trustees in DEI issues, about what the purpose of a truth reconciliation commission might be on campus, or how to build and program something that connects STEM and art, we're happy to keep these conversations going. On Twitter, just use the hashtag FTTE. You can tweet at me, Brian Alexander. You can bring in shindig events. And of course, on my blog, we'll be glad to hear from you. If you'd like to go back into the past and look at our previous sessions covering a wide range of these topics, just head to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive, where we've got about 270 recordings on all these issues. And otherwise, the fall semester is about to come upon us. I know things are scrambling right now because of COVID and Delta. I hope all of you stay safe and take care. Um, keep thinking about these issues, and we'll see you next time online. Bye-bye, everyone.